Would you be intrigued if I told you that a plane was hijacked in November 1971 and the culprit got away with a $200,000 ransom, which will be worth about one and a half million dollars in today's money? What if I told you the case remains unsolved to this day, even by the FBI? It sounds like the plot of a Tom Cruise movie, right? Well, it isn't. It really happened. Welcome back to Air Scare Stories. Today we'll be looking at the infamous hijacking of Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305 by the man known only as D.B. Cooper. It's a beautiful Wednesday afternoon in Portland, Oregon, the day before Thanksgiving actually in 1971, and millions of Americans are making preparations for the long holiday weekend. For some this means having to travel long distances to connect with friends and family. For others, Thanksgiving is just another workday with an annoyingly long commute. Northwest Orient Airlines recognizes this and is still running its routine passenger flight 305, a short hop of about 35 minutes between Portland, Oregon and Seattle, Washington. Today's flight has 36 passengers, only a third of its usual capacity, and six crew members. The captain for today's flight is William Scott, assisted by First Officer William Ratachak and Flight Engineer Harold Anderson. By 2.50 p.m. local time, the plane takes off from Portland heading towards Seattle. Just a few minutes into the flight, the smartly dressed middle-aged man with the briefcase in seat 18E, who had booked his ticket under the name Dan Cooper, calls over one of the flight attendants and orders his favorite drink, bourbon and 7-Up. He later hands her a note, and based on his outfit, she assumes he's just another businessman trying to flirt with her and give her his number. So without even looking at it, she drops it into her purse. But seeing this, the man leans into her and whispers, Miss, you better have a look at that note. I have a bomb. She opens the note, and written in all capital letters are the words, Miss, I have a bomb in my briefcase and want you to sit by me. Realizing that he probably isn't joking, she does as it says and sits next to him. He opens the briefcase on his lap and shows her its contents so she knows he's not playing games. In it, she could see red cylinders in two rows of four with wires attached to them along with a big cylindrical battery. Seeing that he now has her undivided attention, he starts to list his demands. First is $200,000 in cash in a knapsack before 5 p.m. local time. Secondly, he wants four parachutes, two primary or front ones and two reserve or back ones. She nervously writes all this down and then goes up to the cockpit to tell the flight crew what's happening. As soon as she leaves her seat, the hijacker calls over another flight attendant and starts making more demands. He wants a refueling truck to meet them when they land in Seattle and that the plane's tanks be topped off. He tells this 22-year-old flight attendant named Tina Mucklow that he's willing to let the passengers go once the money and parachutes are brought on board. But he also expects everyone to stay in their seats until he's received everything he's asked for and adds that he will not be taken alive. This seemingly unassuming middle-aged man, wearing a dark business suit with sunglasses, has suddenly put the fear of God into the cabin crew. At that time, the passengers weren't aware of what was going on yet. They were just told that the plane would be delayed due to minor technical difficulties. Meanwhile, the crew had made contact with air traffic control and told them about the hijacker and his demands. Air traffic control then informed local and federal authorities. Donald Nyrop, the president of Northwest Orient Airlines, asked the crew to cooperate with the hijacker's demands and authorized payment of the ransom. The plane ended up circling around Puget Sound for close to two hours to give the FBI and Seattle police enough time to gather the ransom money and the parachutes. This also gave them plenty of time to gather emergency personnel in case the hijacker decided to do something stupid once the plane was on the ground. Back in the passenger cabin, Cooper had specifically demanded that Tina Mucklow stay by his side. During her time with him, he would occasionally make comments about their current location, showing that he was familiar with the terrain they were flying over. He was able to point out McCord Air Force Base and the city of Tacoma as well. For reasons we'll never know for sure, he also engaged the flight attendant in small talk. He asked where she was from, and she told him she was from Pennsylvania, but was currently living in Minneapolis. He replied that Minnesota was a very nice country, which may have indicated that he'd been there before. When she tried to ask him where he was from, he became visibly upset and told her that he wouldn't answer that question. Probably because he knew that could come back to bite him in the flotation device, if you know what I mean. He asked her if she smoked, and she said she was actually trying to quit. But he asked her to share a cigarette with him anyway, and she willingly obliged. A little while later, she asked him why he chose to hijack a Northwest Orient plane, which is a pretty bold move if you ask me. And his response was, It's not because I have a grudge against your airlines. It's just because I have a grudge. Meanwhile, a passenger who was visiting the bathroom tried to ask the flight attendant for more information about the supposed mechanical issue that was keeping them in the air. 
This initially amused Cooper as he watched her struggle to make up lies about him to keep everyone on the plane calm. But the man's persistence soon irritated him and he ended up asking the guy to return to his seat. But the other guy just kept asking questions because of course he had no idea what was really going on. In the end, she gave him a copy of New Yorker magazine and he reluctantly returned to his seat. Back on the ground, the FBI agents had just finished gathering the ransom money from the banks in Seattle. 10,000 unmarked $20 bills to be precise. The serial numbers of the bills began with the letter L, indicating that they were from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And microfilm photos were taken of each of the bills. Getting the parachutes proved to be more of a challenge for the authorities than the cash did. When military parachutes were offered by McCord Air Force Base personnel, Cooper rejected them and insisted he wanted civilian parachutes with manually operated ripcords. Fortunately, the Seattle police were able to acquire these from a local skydiving school. Just before 5.30 p.m. local time, the flight crew were informed that Cooper's conditions had been met and that they could finally land, let the passengers go, and pick up the money in the parachutes. Captain Scott landed the plane at Seattle Tacoma Airport at 5.46 p.m. And with Cooper's permission, he parked away from the main terminal on a partially lit runway. Cooper had demanded that only one representative from the airline approach the plane with his ransom money and parachutes. And he allowed his favorite flight attendant, Tina Mucklow, to go off and get the items. Mucklow exited the plane via the front door, descended the mobile stairway that had been brought out, and quickly returned with the money. After inspecting it, Cooper agreed to let all the passengers go, just as he'd promised. Of course, the atmosphere on board the plane was still pretty tense at least for young Mucklow, who was the one dealing with Cooper directly. To reduce the tension, she jokingly asks Cooper if she could have some of the money, and to her surprise, he hands her a packet of bills. She was shocked by the gesture, but politely declined it, telling him that it was against company policy to accept gratuities. And it wasn't just her he'd been willing to give money to. Earlier in the flight, he'd tried to tip the other two flight attendants with his own personal money before the whole hijacking started. But they also declined for the same reason. Maybe he was actually a really nice guy who was just desperate for money, like a 1970s Walter White. Once all the passengers were safely off the plane, the only people left on board were Cooper, the three flight crew, and the three cabin crew. Tina Mucklow was sent out of the plane again, at least three more times, to get the heavy parachutes and bring them back to Cooper, who was sitting at the rear of the plane. Florence Schaffner, the first flight attendant who Cooper gave the note to, approaches him and asks if she could get her purse in the compartment behind his seat. He tells her that that would be fine and then jokingly says, don't worry, I won't bite. For someone who'd just put the whole plane through an armed hijacking, you gotta admit he was playing it pretty cool. Maybe it was this cool demeanor of his that gave two of the flight attendants the courage to walk up to him and ask if they could leave. The funny thing is he obliged and said, whatever you girls would like. Who's this guy, James Bond? They didn't need to be told twice and quickly got off the plane, leaving only Tina Mucklow, who'd just come back on board to drop off the last parachute. She also gives Cooper a piece of paper with instructions on how to use the parachute, but he tells her he doesn't need it. He was, however, not very happy about the money being delivered in a cloth bag instead of a backpack, as he'd asked. This would impede his ability to carry the money, but he improvises and cuts the canopy out of one of the reserve parachutes and stuffs the money in there. The refueling process ended up taking longer than he was expecting, which made him irritable and nervous. He soon started saying things like, this shouldn't take so long, and let's get this show on the road. He outlined his flight plan to the cockpit crew, which was a southeast course towards Mexico City at the minimum airspeed possible without stalling the plane at a maximum altitude of 10,000 feet. He also demanded that the cabin remain unpressurized and that the landing gear remain deployed with the wing flaps lowered 15 degrees and the rear exit door opened and its air stair extended. After analyzing all of that, the first officer, William Ratachek, told Cooper that with all those modifications, the plane's range would be limited to just about a thousand miles, which would make it necessary to refuel before getting to Mexico City. Exploring their options, both Cooper and the crew agreed that it would be best to do so at Reno Tahoe International Airport. Northwest Orion's home office also chimed in, saying they weren't comfortable with them taking off with the aft staircase deployed. Cooper insisted it was safe, but to put their minds at ease, he agreed that they could take off with the stairs secured and that he would only deploy them once they were up in the air. However, this was on the condition that Tina Mucklow came with them and deployed the stairs for him when he was ready, which I'm sure she was very happy about. With that, the Boeing 727 takes off again at 7.40 p.m. with the three flight crew, Mucklow, and of course the man of the hour, D.B. Cooper. Unknown to Cooper, three Air Force fighter jets were following closely behind them, flying in S patterns behind the slow-moving 727. 
Two of them were F-106 fighter jets from McCord Air Force Base, and they followed behind Flight 305 with one above and one below so they'd be out of Cooper's view. A Lockheed T-33 trainer was also diverted from an unrelated Air National Guard mission to tail the flight, but it never ended up making visual contact with them. Once they were airborne, Cooper started discussing with Mucklow about the lowering of the aft stairs. But she told him she was afraid of being sucked out of the plane when the stairs were opened. She told the flight crew this as well, and they suggested coming up to the cockpit to get an emergency rope and tying it to herself as a safety line. But Cooper wasn't happy with this and rejected the idea, because he didn't want Tina and the flight crew getting together and possibly coming up with a plan to gang up on him and stop him from getting away. She kept expressing her fear of being sucked out, however, and at one point even asked that Cooper cut a cord from one of the spare parachutes to make a safety line for her. But in the end, he told her to just go up into the cockpit and that he would lower the aft stairs himself. Nobody knows if he did this because he liked her and wanted to just calm her fears, or if he wanted to ensure her safety and make sure she really didn't get sucked out of the plane, or maybe he was just getting annoyed at her for not doing what he wanted anymore. Anyway, he tells her not to come back into the passenger cabin again. She begs him to take the bomb with him, and he gives her his word that he'll either disarm it or take it with him. So she goes up into the cockpit and closes the curtain partition behind her as he'd asked. Remember, this is way before the days of locked cockpit doors. As she moves further into the cockpit, she turns and takes a final look at the man who had kept her at his side for more than six hours. And she sees him standing in the aisle tying something around his waist, which she assumes is the ransom money. And that's the last time anyone ever sees him again. At approximately 8 p.m., warning lights flash in the cockpit, indicating that the aft air stair has been activated. The crew communicates through the intercom, asking Cooper if he needs help. He simply replies, no, which is followed by a noticeable change in air pressure, and at approximately 8.13 p.m., the plane's tail suddenly swings upward, forcing the pilots to adjust the elevator trim to bring it back to level flight. Unsure of whether Cooper was still on board, Mucklow calls over the intercom, saying they'll be arriving at Reno Tahoe soon, and that he needs to raise the stairs to avoid any damage to the plane. She repeats this several times with no response, so they had no choice but to land the plane with the aft stairs still deployed. Waiting for them at Reno Tahoe International Airport are FBI agents, state troopers, sheriffs, deputies, and the Reno police. They initially didn't approach the plane when it landed out of fear that Cooper might set off the bomb. But the captain soon confirms that Cooper's no longer on board, and the FBI bomb squad enters the plane to make sure it's safe. After a 30-minute sweep, they confirm that it is, and the ordeal is finally over for the tired crew. Cooper had kept his word and didn't set the bomb off after all his conditions were met. So who was D.B. Cooper and what happened to him? The truth is, we don't really know. The only thing we do know about him is that he purchased his ticket under the name Dan Cooper. No personal items of his were recovered, except for the black clip-on tie he had on when he first boarded the plane, and two of the four parachutes which he left behind. Based on eyewitness reports, a couple of composite sketches were made of him. Lots of interviews were conducted in the hopes of identifying him or finding clues that could tell investigators who he was, but nothing substantial was ever learned. One of the first suspects police looked at was a local Oregon man named D.B. Cooper, who had a minor police record. He was soon eliminated as a suspect, but the media, quick to report on the brazen hijacking, mistook the name on the passenger manifest, Dan Cooper, with this now eliminated suspect, D.B. Cooper, and mistakenly reported the hijacker's name as D.B. Cooper. This was then republished by other media outlets, and pretty much overnight, the hijacker became known as D.B. Cooper. So, at this point, you probably have a bunch of questions, like, how could a man jump out of an airliner mid-flight back in the 1970s, and to this day, no one knows who he was or where he disappeared to? And what about the fighter jets that were tailing them? You'd think they could have picked up if someone jumped out of the plane, especially when he probably deployed a parachute big enough to be seen, even if the guy himself wasn't. Well, apparently, neither of the two fighter pilots saw anything exit the plane, either visually or on radar. Of course, given that he jumped at night, it's not that surprising that they didn't see anything. Still, you'd expect the radar to have picked up something, but it didn't. Later on in the investigation, the Air Force got involved, offering their SR-71 Blackbird to help retrace and photograph the flight path from Seattle. They did this in the hopes of finding some of the items Cooper may have left the plane with. But after five attempts, they had to give up, because they couldn't get any usable pictures due to the low visibility at the extremely high altitude that SR-71s are required to fly. Experimental recreations using the actual plane from the hijacking with the exact same flight configurations were also attempted. 
They even had FBI agents push a 200 pound sled out the open air stair to reproduce the upward swing of the tail section and the brief change in cabin pressure to try and generate possible trajectories that could tell where Cooper may have landed. These put Cooper's landing zone within Washington State near Lake Merwin, but search teams came back empty handed. Aerial searches were also conducted with no luck. However, a few years later, a small flicker of hope was ignited when an eight-year-old boy discovered three packets of cash, totaling $5,800, as he raked the Sandy River Bank along the Columbia River to build a campfire. But this hope that the rest of the money and the whereabouts of D.B. Cooper had finally been found was quickly extinguished when further searches in the area revealed nothing. In fact, the investigators concluded that the money couldn't have been intentionally buried there back in 1971, because it appeared that it had tumbled and been washed down the river for many miles. But they also concluded that it couldn't have washed down very recently either, because the money was matted and bundled together, and the rubber bands holding the bundles together would have disintegrated within a few weeks of being exposed to the elements. So despite the fact that they found some of the money, it really left the investigators with more questions than answers. Northwest Orient Airlines offered a reward of up to $25,000 to anyone who could help return the rest of the missing ransom money, but nobody ever claimed it. Though some people did try to take advantage of D.B. Cooper mania, like two guys who used counterfeit $20 bills printed with the Cooper serial numbers on them, which had previously been released to the public. They used the counterfeit bills to swindle $30,000 from a Newsweek reporter named Carl Fleming, promising him an interview with a guy that they claimed was D.B. Cooper, but of course this turned out to be a scam. The FBI kept the D.B. Cooper case active for almost 50 years until July of 2016, when they finally announced the official end of what they'd been calling the Norjack or Northwest hijacking case. So who was this guy D.B. Cooper? Where did he go after jumping out of that airliner? Why did he do it? And what did he do with all that money? These are all questions that are still unanswered even today. All we really have to go on about the mysterious D.B. Cooper are guesswork, speculation, and a long list of potential suspects who fit his description to some degree or another. Lots of petty criminals were accused of being him, and some even confessed that they were him, but none with evidence conclusive enough to pin them down as actually being D.B. Cooper. Some investigators think he never even survived the jump, because the poor weather on the night of the hijacking, along with the remoteness of the wilderness he jumped into, and his lack of any survival equipment would have made it almost impossible, even for an experienced paratrooper. Besides that, the fact that the ransom money never turned up anywhere, even decades after the hijacking, suggests that it was never spent, which could also mean he never survived to spend it. As with all incidents and accidents in aviation, changes are always adopted afterward to make sure they never happen again. In the aftermath of the D.B. Cooper incident, the use of metal detectors and compulsory luggage searches became standard procedure. Boeing 727 designs were also updated with what they called Cooper vanes, which would prevent the aft staircase from being lowered when the plane was in flight. These are simple little devices that are basically just a spring-loaded paddle mounted on the fuselage near the aft stairs. When the plane was flying, the force of the passing air would hit the paddle and turn it, moving this little piece of metal down, which would physically block the stairway from being lowered. In the late 1960s and early 70s, airplane hijacking was extremely popular, with an average of one every five days globally. That is crazy, right? D.B. Cooper's hijacking didn't help the statistic much, as it led to a number of early copycat attempts. But the new security measures were eventually instated, and airplane hijackings decreased significantly after that. Well, this has been a relatively long video for me, but only because we're talking about the super interesting D.B. Cooper case. The funny thing is, the story gets way crazier, and there's still more I'd love to talk about, especially about the long list of crazy suspects. Let me know if you'd be interested in hearing about them in the comments section below, and maybe I'll make a video about them. Hit the bell and the like and the subscribe, tell your friends and family about the channel, send me plane crash videos, join my Patreon, um, call me, look me up on TikTok and Twitter, send me a wrap, like a lettuce wrap, and I'll see you on the next Air Scare Stories.